Hello! It's another day in the conservatory, another pint of Robinson squash, so that can only mean one thing. It's time for Socially Distant Discover Nature. We'll start today with the briefest of catch-ups. Hannah from St Nick sent in this flower picture, which I didn't include in last week's video, cheekily, because I was trying to work out what it was, and I think it's a common spotted orchid, which is beautiful. We've also had Simon from Kent send in this small magpie moth that he caught in his makeshift moth trap, which is kind of a light bulb and some sheets hanging outside, which is also a great find. And now, because I haven't managed to get rid of him, we're going to go live to Genghis Mirazapan, roving wildlife reporter in the loosest sense of the term, who's in a field or, or something, and I'm going to give this my full attention. <sighs> yes, hello, it's uh, Genghis Mirazapan here, wildlife roving, well, revolving reporter. Why am I revolving, I hear you cry? Well, I shall tell you I'm... I'm revolving to show you that I'm in the middle of a field. Why am I in the middle of a field? Well, I was told that in the middle of this field there was a, a whole nest of young hares. Well, that hasn't actually turned out to be the case. It was a bit of a disappointment. I, it probably wasn't called a nest of young hares anyway, because as you know, some of these animals have... have terms so when there's lots of them i mean like the uh, the crows i happen to know that one is a, a bloodbath of crows uh, very strange anyway uh, so as i say nothing here got to get back out of this field the, the farmer mr reisenbach who gave me the uh, the permission to come out here said i must be careful to go back the same way i came in otherwise uh, if i strayed off the path <laughs> i would fall down <laughs> Okay, um, down the bottom of a uh, sinkhole or something. Uh, might need a bit of help here, Phil. Thank you very much. Back to you, possibly, if you can still hear me. Sorry, what was that? Ah, probably nothing. Today's episode is all about how to make a wildlife pond, or rather how not to make a wildlife pond. So today we're going to explore what went wrong, and this is good for you guys because I have made all the mistakes so you don't have to. Choosing a site for the pond is the most important step. I chose one which was in the sun, which is really good, but unfortunately there's a nearby ash tree that sheds leaves constantly into the pond, which then rot away and enrich it and cause kind of algal scum to form. So that's not great. My first step was clearing the gravel that was already there. That was, well, that happened. Um, a little hard work, doesn't really matter. The next thing to do was to dig the hole. And so I dug a hole and then it looked too shallow. So I dug it even deeper and then I actually read some information about ponds from the Freshwater Habitats Trust. They've got a whole information pack and I had dug the pond too deep. So then I had to fill back in. And ideally the pond should be 30 centimeters depth at the deepest point. So yeah, there was a lot of reed landscaping involved and I really, really did a lot of effort for nothing in those early stages. My next stage was getting the the liner for the pond. There was also an underlay that went in. Um, that was okay. The actual liner, the size of the liner, the habitats, uh, Freshwater Habitats Trust had a special formula that you put in your dimensions, works out what it should be. I didn't entirely trust it, therefore I upped the numbers, and as a result ended up with a huge amount of liner, which was completely unnecessary uh, and a massive waste of money and it's still in the garage. So yeah, lesson, a very important lesson is trust the Freshwater Habitats Trust. They know what they're doing. It's kind of in the name. Once I put the liner on, I put in a little bit of uh, rainwater just to form the shape. So it, it sat in the basin of the earth and then I cut off the excess liner. There was so much of it, so, so much excess liner. 
Oh dear, that was that was a mistake. Um, I've tried to reuse some of it in the tomato boxes. Anyway, too much liner. And then I needed to kind of bury the edges in a little trench that I dug and then put the soil back on there. And then it started to look a little bit like a pond. I also, well, how did I fill up the pond? I filled it up with rainwater. This is the absolute correct thing to do. Um, tap water contains far too much nutrients, so the stuff that's coming out of hose pipes, outdoor taps, too much nutrients, and again that will enrich your pond and cause algal scum, and just make it unsuitable. So rainwater was absolutely the right decision in this case. It did take frickin' ages to fill up, mind you. During the course of filling up the pond with rainwater, I started to make some more mistakes. So I got a little bit paranoid about the, the bare liner being exposed, because I did it in a slightly weird position, so there was like a cliff face of liner. If liner gets exposed to the sun, that can degrade it, it can sort of abrade, and then your pond will start to leak. So I decided to cover up the bare liner with big rocks, kind of slabs that I bought at the garden centre, again, spending money unnecessarily. And also, I decided to landscape it to hide the liner using nice shiny pebbles, which looked absolutely amazing when they went in. However, pebbles provide a large surface area for stuff to grow on. The guy in the garden centre warned me about this, and he said you'll get all sorts of algae growing on it, and it'll enrich your pond. Didn't believe him, thought I knew best. Algal growth happened. So, yeah, avoid the pebbles. The old uh, liner being exposed problem could have been avoided if I'd put the pond in a better area where I could have properly sort of marked it out and levelled it. It's kind of boxed in, really, in that position. There's a sort of rock, I don't know, stone border to a flower bed, another stone wall. It's hemmed in. I can't do nice sloping stuff. It's a weird shape, it's completely unsuitable, it should not have been built there. So pick a better site when you make your own pond. Next up, I decided to buy some plants from the garden centre, and I tried to get one that were kind of um, British, native, wild flower pond species, so not things that necessarily been imported from far away, bringing in all sorts of pests, so that, that was kind of good. Perhaps it, it would have been better to just leave it and see if anything grew. I, um, I'm quite impatient, so I did not do that. I put in some, some nice plants. Oh, that's my uh, I'm talking too much alarm, so we'll speed things along. Yeah, I put in too many plants, far too many plants that have swamped the pond, leaving very little amount of kind of bare water. Big mistake. Haven't had the heart to rip them out, because I paid money for them. So. I want to do that. Anyway, once it was full up with rainwater and the pretty plants, it looked good and there was life almost straight away. Little tiny water fleas, Daphnia, wiggly larvae of some sort, and it was good. And then it went wrong pretty quickly. Massive amounts of slime and algae and all sorts of stuff. It just became a big bowl of gunk. I couldn't really see if anything was alive in it anymore. The algae and the slime, no doubt the water was enriched from all the ash leaves falling in and rotting down, um, soil falling in potentially from the sides, but also the massive surface area on which the algal slime can grow. What did I do? I tried to get rid of it. Someone recommended little bales of barley straw put in. Didn't work at all. Someone else recommended aerating the water using a pump, so I brought a little solar-powered water pump to bubble through the water, oxygenate it, get rid of the algae. That didn't work. Kind of gave up on the pond, really. Um, it just became a bird bath, or a bird uh, drinking station. At the beginning of this year, or the beginning of spring this year, there looked to be no life in it at all, not so much as a water flea. And during the most recent heat wave a couple of weeks ago, it dried up almost entirely. There was no water left. I had to water the plants still in their pots in the pond just to keep them alive. And I thought, I, I made a decision. I decided to do the terrible sin of filling up the pond with a hose pipe. 
Obviously that's a waste of water, but also the water is full of nutrients, so that's no good, not good conditions for pond creatures. But I decided because it was a dead zone, I should just not let all those plants that I'd spent money on die. So I filled it up and I consigned myself to pond jail and that it was completely and utterly a failure. Don't get me wrong, it looks very pretty. So is there actually any life left in it? Well, we will explore that another day. We will explore that next week when we're going to try some actual pond dipping to see if there are any creatures left, any creatures that have survived my terrible pond creation and maintenance regime. And now we're going to go back to Genghis, who is in some kind of trouble, apparently. Yes, hello, Phil. Uh, um, Genghis Marazapan here, still down me pit. Um, I'm going to try something, because not getting much rescuing happening. I've seen a film uh, had a dog in it called Cassie or something, who rescued everybody in sight. So I thought if I could get hold of me uh, Shesmerelda, she could uh, get help. So, uh, just a matter of getting her attention, isn't it? So, Shazza! Oh, there's scuttly things down here. Shazza! Oh, I can't feel my legs. That's a bit weird. Shazza! Oh, and my battery's running out. It's not looking good. Shazza! Shazza! Oh no, Genghis! That's, that's so unfortunate. You, you take care of yourself. Rest assured that I'll be monitoring this situation very carefully. Well, after all that excitement, I think it's time to calm down by looking at some of this amazing artwork that's sent in by Judith from Kent. Incredible. Well, that's all for today's episode, but before we go, I've just heard that Genghis has been rescued, which is a shame that he wasn't rescued sooner. Um, oh, and he has sent a video message, so let's have a look at that. Hello, Phil. Yes, Genghis Marazapan here. And yes, here I am looking out of my hospital window. Everything's okay. I did manage to get hold of me dog, Shazza, and she she ran off. I gather she bit a policeman on the leg, uh, who then chased her into my field, uh, fell down me pit along with me. But of course, he was managed to radio for help, and here I am. The rest, as they say, is history. Uh, only problem is, me legs. Can't move them. Totally gone. So, um... You'll be hearing from me solicitor uh, about the work-related injuries. Shouldn't be more than a few million. Probably won't be working for you much more now, if, if at all. Um, so, so thanks. It's been, it's been fun. Goodbye. Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Oh, I need to phone scenics and Kathy and leave the country. Titled F Fade to Black, Fade to Black. Why is it always me who has to fade to black? Beaky, we're in trouble. Left my phone. Wait a minute. There's more to his message. It looks like he left his phone recording. Oh, blimey. Thank God that's over. Don't have to make that stupid, strange voice anymore. Anyway, Rachel, Rachel, phone that Chris Packham. Tell him it's done. I've nobbled the competition. Done what he asked. Made him look silly. Sued him for millions. Not a problem. Ha, sorted. Yeah, the only thing that, uh, while you're about it, the only thing that Phil bloke uh, got right was uh, get us a drink, will ya? He was right about the Robinsons. Good stuff. <sighs> right. The excuse me, I need to go give Genghis a get well soon present. I think this spade should do. Beaky, get your coat.